to the CMB lens by the star forming galaxies. Olivier Doré. Doré. See you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Is it work? Okay. Hi, everyone. So I'm um, very happy and very honored to be able to present you some of our latest results. And I will, uh, in particular, I will focus on um, the analysis we, we, we wrote, which is a correlation between the gravitational lensing on the infrared backgrounds. And as we just heard from, um, from Karim, a great thing Planck can do is provide a full sky projecting mass of the visible universe on using, for using a quadratic estimator applied to, to the CMB channels, 143 and 217 um, channels, we can produce this map, which is really, you can see as a map of the large scale structure with a, with a projected map, of course, with a sensitivity between redshift one and redshift three, okay? And as you know, the gradient of this map will give you the deflection angle, which is a remapping between the initial direction on the one we observe, okay? So that's, that's fantastic. But another thing that Planck does very well is mapping dust, okay? And this is, of course, by design. And you can see it in this beautiful map at 545 gigahertz where you see the really uh, diffuse and elongated uh, galactic dust. But if you, if you zoom in a little more, you see outside, because galac extragalactic dust looks very much like, um, like galactic dust. It's just a repeated featureless spectra, unfortunately. Um, we also map really well the infrared background, okay? And, the, and the, as you know, the infrared background is basically the cumulative high Z emission from dusty galaxies. And it's, uh, you, you, I plotted here at 857 gigahertz, but you could scan through frequency, go to 857, 545, 353, even 217. It's more challenging, but you still see it. And you see a very diffuse structure, which is highly correlated, right? The correlation of the CIB across frequencies is about 80 or 90 percent, okay? So, and, and of course, this galaxy also live in lump of dark matter, and this lump of dark matter will also will participate to the, lens of, to the lensing of the CMB. And, and you also see from this map that actually there is a very, if you want to produce, if you want to make careful analysis of the CIB fluctuations, you have to be very careful about the galactic dust. So you really cannot produce this type of map without carefully removing the galactic dust. Okay, that's something to keep in mind. So since I realize I'm actually the first one to, to talk about the CIB, I will give you a little more details. Um, but really the, the motivation to study the CIB is the fact that it's for on one hand, it's a dominant extragalactic foreground at most frequency, at small scale, at most frequency above 217 gigahertz. And, but it's also interesting by itself because uh, it's produced basically by uh, star forming galaxies, which are UV, UV bright, and like the stars are UV bright, which will, on the dust, will ab uh, absorb and re emit this radiation in the infrared. And so that the CIB itself is a very good proxy to study the star formation history of the universe. And, <clears throat> and so that's, that's one of the key motivations to study them. And they're actually using the CIB. You can look, you can probe the star formation rate by doing a redshift of one and two, which is a regime which is very hard to probe otherwise. Okay? And in the last, and it was, the interest was highlighted very early on by, in this paper by Bruce Patrick and Jim Peebles. And then it was discovered later on uh, with Faraz and the Derby. And it's clearly the field is very data driven, and it's, so the improvement in data in the last few years led to a, a vast improvement of understanding of this radiation with uh, using this, uh, this experiment. So what Planck adds to this game is basically the low frequency, and be because of the way and low frequency translated back to higher z, so uh, adding Planck into this game allows us to probe the star formation rate at higher redshift, and also, and also Planck clearly adds a larger scale, so which is linear scale, which are somewhat higher, to, uh, easier to model, okay? And, and so because uh, this fl the fluctuation in this background trace the, last the same large scale structure distribution that, is, that will create the lensing, it, we can expect a correlation between the CIB and the CMB. And this was an idea which was uh, uh, proposed in this paper. And so if you look in a, a little more quantitatively, what you see here is for, it's a, the different role sensitivity 
of the CIB at 217 gigahertz uh, for one multipole, so 500, as a function of redshift, and the color code corresponds to mass cut, okay? And you see the CIB in this, so it's clearly model dependent, it depends on the luminosity you put in, but for, uh, in, this, for in this model, um, the CIB received most of, the CIB received most of this contribution from redshift about two, and from halo mass of between 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 13, okay? And if you look on the other hand here, you look at the CIB, CMB lensing, um, you see that you receive a substantial also amount from the same mass in the same rigid range. So you expect, you do expect a correlation between these two tracers. And so this motivated our work, and we just, if you just take the maps uh, Karim presented, and, you, and if you correlate that with a C, uh, dust map I showed you, you end up with this spectra here, okay? And what you see here is for, so is a cross correlation spectra times L3 as a function of L for the six frequency from 100 gigahertz all the way up to 857 gigahertz. And this, this is like really, there's no, it's just a row um, estimator. There is no work there. And it's very important to realize that because we are working in cross correlation, we are really not sensitive here to galactic dust, which is really a limiting factor when you study the CIB. So it's somewhat, it's a very robust measurement. And we can really measure all the way to very small scales, okay? And what you see here, you see that what you increase in frequency, you see a very, a very high signal very, um, with very high significance. So this, the error bars plotted here are only statistical, and if you compute the significance, it picks about 42 sigma at uh, 545 gigahertz here, okay? And um, the error bars, the signal, the solid curve here that you see is not, it's a, it's a prediction from the model we developed for the early paper, so which was published for Planck about a year and a half ago. And so you see that if you take it as phase value, if you trust this measurement, if you don't worry about systematic for now, you see that it's, it's a reasonable agreement between the model we predicted and what we measure, okay. And also to give you an idea, and I will elaborate a little more, but to give you an idea of what, of a, uh, you might be skeptical of this, of this correlation, and the gray box here corresponds to the uh, lensing reconstruction at 143 gigahertz correlated with the temperature also at 143 gigahertz. So if there was any funny systematic any in the play, this would be a natural proxy to look at. And you see that the signal we're seeing is way, way uh, above this, uh, this proxy, um, systematic proxy, which is satisfying. And so that's good. So it seems like the signal we're, we're looking for is actually there. So using the data, we can actually play another trick to get a better feeling for this, uh, for this correlation. And this is doing this trick. So if you take, if you take your dust map, so let's say five, at 545 gigahertz, you identify the extrema and you stack, so extrema corresponding to bright region, so massive region, you stack on them, you will average to a symmetric uh, structure and you, you end up with a color scale, color um, background here, okay? If you um, stack on minima, you end up with, un you are basically selecting under density or voids and you end up with this uh, deficit here, okay? And if you select on random points, you end up with noise, which is what you see here, okay? Now, you take the full sky map, you take the gradient, so which gives you the deflection angle as I mentioned, and you do the same stacking, okay? Um, on the same spot. And you end up with this curvature, with these arrows here, which corresponds really to the deflection angle of this, uh, of the map, as mapped by the CMB lensing. And so you see that indeed when you are over densities, you have more mass and you attract lights. When you're under density, you actually, uh, you, the deflection angle switch sign, okay, which is something uh, very satisfying. And for all of us in the field, uh, I think it's very, it was, uh, it's very nice to actually see the lensing of the CMB in action. So it's a real space visualization of what's going on. So that's really, um, I mean, that's, I think that's a very beautiful picture. And, and also you can see this feature is also kind of neat because you really see it's lensing basically by void. So you can, there is more to be done here. We didn't really, really, uh, really um, investigate that more, but actually probably the first detection of lensing by voids or under densities. Okay, so, but before we get too excited, let's go back to Earth and look at null tests for systematics. And so, the so multiple frequency coverage and the so multi multiple redundancy allowed by the data allow for plenty of null tests to be carried, and we, 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 we play this game extensively. And so I present you here some results only at 545 gigahertz 
but we studied all frequencies. And you see, for example, here, you see what we do here. We know, we know the T signal using either half, ring, um, half of the pointing period. So we, we divide the pointing period into two, takes a difference, so you remove the temperature signal, and then you correlate with phi. For this one, we correlate, we cut the data set in detectors, we do the different, and we know the temperature signal. On this one, we do survey differences, and so on. For this one, and you can see, so except for, for this, which is actually, you see this, uh, this particular survey difference, we, we, the chi square is a bit high, but we actually understand it as a drift uh, evolution, which is consistent with what we know about 1.5%. So it's not good, but we, 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 we will improve in the future. And so you see that there is no clear sign. On this test, it has to be said, are very stringent in terms of systematic beam effects, again, drift, um, Etc. So they're passing this test is really a non-trivial test for for data set. You can also do uh, you can consider various galactic masks. So our nominal uh, galaxy is a, our nominal mask is about 40% of the sky, which is quite conservative. But if you either consider a more aggressive mask where you keep only 20% of the sky, or you keep a a more uh, extended analysis where you keep 60% of the sky, you see that our, our results are fairly consistent, okay? So which is a good sign. And, and th this, all these tests were for null temperature, but you can also null the, the lensing reconstruction. And what we did here, we reconstructed the lensing at various frequencies. So our basic reconstruction is at 143, but we can also uh, reconstruct it using 100 gigahertz channel. And we differentiate, and you get zero. You can also reconstruct the lensing at 217, etc. And you can also consider two masks for the lensing reconstruction. And all these tests pass uh, pretty nicely. So, after this result, you can believe. I think you, it's, you can believe what you what you saw previously in terms of it being a signal. But of course, the, the, the real question, well, the next question is, of course, is it really what we want it to be? Is it really the CIB lensing? So for example, you can wonder about the SZ contamination. So is SZ uh, possible contamination? And so from what we know, everything we know from SZ and lensing, um, we know that this contamination is, should, should be very small, should be very negligible. But still, we try to investigate it, and the way we did it, the, what we did, we of course used the very well-known um, as the frequency dependence. And what you did, we considered two very uh, wide beams in L, between 300 and 450, and between 1200 and uh, 1450. And you see the black points are our measurements with error bars, okay? And, um, and we compared two, so, on the, so if you look at this curve here, which is a F, C, A, B only, F, so for the fixed and SED or the GSPR CD, the first thing we do is to look whether the spectra we observe match what we expect. And this temp these two uh, SED here correspond to what we know from the, from the CIB. And, and, uh, and there is no, f no, no fit here, right? So we just really match an amplitude here, and the rest is the, predict the expected uh, dust spectra from, uh, from the CIB. And you see that it's a pretty good. Uh, uh, is a very good fit, right, at both, uh, both, uh, both frequencies. I know the, the real question for this, for this SD is, is whether adding SD component and fitting for the joint amplitude improves the fit, and we find that it doesn't. So there's really no evidence for uh, SD spectra in our data. So using that, and this SD spectra, like the absolute value of the SD, the best fit SD contribution corresponds to the blue point here. So you see that it's all the time negligible as compared to our, to our signal. Okay, so we can rule out the SD contribution. Another one is, of is also the, the bispectrum of the CIB. Okay, so what we are doing ultimately, we are correlating a, a, a phi map which is computed using a quadratic estimator to a temperature map. And so we are really measuring a, a very well tailored bispectra. And so one question is, we know the CIB is due to the growth of large-scale structure, so it's clearly there is a non-linearity, so clearly there will be a bispectra. Okay, so the question, can we be contaminated by this bispectra? And, um, and it's very hard to answer because we really don't know much about this bispectra, uh, about this bispectra itself. There, have been, there has been a detection by the SPT uh, team, but it's really hard to translate into, into um, this foreground. So what we did to set up an upper limit on this bispectra, we did a lensing reconstruction on the 545 gigahertz, which is really dominated by the CIB signal. Okay, so it's really what you would not want to do for the CMB, but we use this uh, lensing reconstruction on the 545, correlated with the four, 545, and then scale it back to, the, to our nominal 143 lensing reconstruction. And so, and you see that here, 
we consider various sky masks for this CIB. This is a, the 545 five, 545 temperature, and you see that there's a very wide um, galactic dependence, really, which is really the fact that we are looking at the bispectra of dust, galactic dust. But on the other hand, on large scale, we seem to reach some kind of convergence when we go to very small patches. Okay, so we take that as a as an upper limit on as a somewhat a measurement of the CIB by spectra on small scale, and then we scale back to basically what it should, what it should be using the 143 gigahertz. And so to, to, summarize, um, to summarize the possible astrophysical contaminants, um, you have, we have this four plot, so the, this, this six panel, and you see this, um, all these measurements, so correspond to the point I showed you before, uh, the SD contribution corresponds to the dashed line. The CIB bas spectra would correspond to this dashed line at this, this dotted line at this frequency, and the SW contribution, which I didn't mention, but it's it is in there, it's also negligible. And, all, and we also, I didn't have time to discuss it, but I don't have time to discuss it, but uh, we also develop an st optimal statistic to measure the point source contribution to the signal. And we, it's non it's a small correction, but we measure it and we correct for it. So av after having excluded basically at this point, I think we have convincingly excluded all possible astrophysical contaminants or signal, and also all possible uh, instrumental contaminants or signal. And so we are really left to, to believe what we see and interpret it as a correlation between the CIB and the lensing. And, and so we, we, we start to, at this point, we start to model it. And, and what we did we d was to model jointly the, the CIB autospectra measured on small patches of the sky with exquisite dust cleaning, and I really, I won't go into these details, and we fit that jointly with a CIB lensing by spectra. And so you see that uh, from this simple formalism, what we really need, uh, you basically we need to model the emissivity of the, um, of the galaxy as a function of redshift. And what the mod we consider two models to do that. One, uh, where we have a, a Simple, constant with redshift, linear bias for the for the galaxy bias. On another one, when we have a more sophisticated HOD-based approach to um, to model the clustering of galaxies. And uh, and then, but uh, we don't make any assumption about the emissivity, but we try to reconstruct it in three redshift bin for at each frequency. Okay. And, and so and this is just a first stage, and in the, in the coming paper focus on CIB, we are, um, we are developing, f we are developing f more sophisticated models. Um, anyway, but the bottom line is that this model works very well, and so and here you see for the lensing CIB cross spectra, you see um, the halo model corresponds to the color curve here, and the chi-square corresponds to contribution to this frequency to the overall chi-square, okay? And, and here's the CIB uh, lensing spectra, so CIB uh, lensing, CIB, CIB lensing cross spectra, and here's the CIB auto spectra, and they are all fitted uh, properly by this model. So um, I skip that, but basically, so what, where we really want to go, of course, to learn something about these galaxies, and by using these emissivities, we can, on assuming some kind of what we call an effective SED, and, and then relying on the Kinnikat law, we can transfer these emissivities into uh, star formation rate into various redshift bin, which is really what we want to learn out of the signal. And here you have the number for the emissivity on the star formation rate density. And you see that uh, we basically have a two, two, 2 2.5 sigma uh, measurement for this SFR density in each redshift bin, which is something quite neat. And, um, and this will improve dramatically when we, when we uh, in the next run of CIB auto and cross analysis. So, but this is just to show you what we can learn from this. And uh, the bottom line is that we, by using the cross correlation between CIB and the CMB lensing, for which we know exactly the redshift depend, we know very well the redshift dependence. We can uh, we can extract, uh, we can learn a little more about the redshift dependent on the CIB, which is a, which is neat. Okay, and to conclude. Uh, Using Planck data alone, we reported on a very strong correlation between the CIB lensing and the temperature map at all frequency above 217, and also marginal, marginal, detection, marginal signal, let's say, at 143 gigahertz. We excluded a null test. We, using a null test, we excluded uh, important, uh, important uh, systematic effects. We 
excluded in an important contamination by other astrophysical processes. Um, and, and so we thus interpret this measurement as the expected correlation between the CMB and the CIB. Okay? And the detection level reached um, with systematic effects 24 at 545 gigahertz. Then following the, on this detection, we build two signals and which allow us to measure the SFR density in three redshift beans. Um, pretty wide redshift beans. And so I think it's very, so it's clear that this is a, so there is more to be done here, but um, I think it's a new, it has to be, the all, everyone in the field has to realize that we now have this very good tracer of the CMB lensing. So the correlation is about 80% and it's clear there are much more that will be done and it will be interesting for CIB clearly because we know we have another probe of the, CIB, of the frequency dependent on a relative dependence, but it will also be interesting for the CMB lensing because we have no very good proxy for the CMB lensing itself. And I want to mention also that uh, um, there was also another measurement just up here uh, the day before us on, uh, on the archive by the Herschel SPT team and the results are very, uh, are very consistent and I can show you a comparison if you are interested. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olivier. Questions? Uh, the recent time, yes, over there. Please wait for the microphone. It's coming. The microphone is coming. Okay. You I'm can use right here one. already. Thank you. Your name, please. Um, just one question. What are the prospects of having a CIB map for multiples below 100? Well, that's the thing, right? So because we are doing cross correlation, so you are worried about dust contamination or? Yeah, galactic well, dust contamination. Right, but are we going to have a full sky CIB map sometime? No, I mean, it's, I mean you need, as, a, as you know, serious contamination is a really big issue at low L. So as you, when you look at this map, I mean, you look at this map and if you, you really need to, the CIB is what's in the background. So you really need to m m remove all this uh, very carefully to, to, uh, to go for the CIB. And the way it is done is using H1 as a tracer of dust. And so we are, if we had a full sky, high resolution H1 map, we could do it. Uh, right now, uh, and Guylaine is working very hard on it, uh, Guylaine Lagache, and so we, we are hoping to, to get about 20% of the sky, which is very exciting, but it's, it's obviously when you, you understand that it's a, it's a challenge to do that. In the <coughs> in the model, as you uh, as you showed it, uh, you get the, uh, the J of Z, the production of the infrared as a function of, of the redshift bins. And so, basically, what we see here is at 217, you get pretty different distribution in redshift than what you get, what we expect at higher frequencies. So that should predict a decorrelation to some degree of decorrelation between 857 and, and, and 217, which was seen, which was seen uh, in the first, in, in the early papers and the small mm -hmm. patches. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, but in the more recent things, uh, this decorrelation seems to have decreased. So do you have, have you been able to, to predict something for that? We, no, we didn't predict something. Um, what we, what I learned, um, what we learned in the last few, few, few months is that all this interpretation has to be, it's really, it has to be said, it's quite model dependent, right? So there is definitely a, a clear degeneracy between the, the model you assume for the galaxy clustering and the, the low you assume for the emissivity and whether you make it mass dependent, etc. And so we are really exploring this right now and it's so, I wouldn't, this is a proof of principle, I wouldn't, uh, there is more to be done in terms of modeling here. More questions? Uh, yes. Can you use this mic? Otherwise, you can use mine. Thank you very much, trainer. Uh, Dave Clements. Um, how does the star formation rate density you're getting for the CIB um, in the various different redshifts compare to what's derived from optical surveys right. looking at the the rest frame optical UV. So it's consistent. And so I, I don't have a plot because we were, it's, uh, I should have a plot. Uh, uh, but Mathieu, who is in back in the room, plotted that. And we are, we, we are about 1.5 sigma high. But so it's totally, it's, we are getting a very reasonable uh, answer so for consistent with half the energy generation coming from direct things we can see in the optical, half from I suspect so, yeah. So it's a, yeah. Okay, more questions? 
If not, let's take our speaker again.